Thank you all so much for coming to uh, Borderlands Cafe, this portion of the Lakeway Lake Hall. We're so excited to be part of this, and we're so happy to have these authors with us. I'm going to do a quick group introduction, and then I'm going to turn it over to them. I'd like to welcome uh, Stephen R. Boyette. His novels include Brand New, Mortality Bridge, as well as Ariel and Ella G. Say hi to my blog! <laughs> <laughs> He's also a well-known DJ who created the Pod Runner Workout, Workout Music Series. My goodness, my tongue is not working. Mira Grant is the author of the new Splash Trilogy of zombie novels starting with Feed and Deadline. She sleeps with a machete under her bed. <laughs> Kristen Amani Kasai is the author of Ice Song and Tattoo. Tattoo is brand new, just out. It's about a gender swapping single mother living among half human mutants. We wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> and Hugo Award winner Tim Pratt is the author of The Street Avengers of Rage Girl, the brand new Briar Patch, and several short story collections. So please welcome these authors. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out. Can you hear me in the cheat seats back there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read from my novel, Mortality Bridge, which came out in hardcover in July, and by some amazing coincidence, is available next door. <laughs> um, uh, the ebook and paperback will be out in a couple of weeks. There's swag that I gave out. If you want to see me afterward, there's a website you can uh, go to with lots of other goodies for it. Uh, Mortality Bridge is pretty much my mashup of the uh, myth of Orpheus, the musician who goes to the underworld to get his uh, wife's soul back. The uh, legend of Faust, the man who sold his soul to the devil in exchange for knowledge and acclaim. And uh, the legend of Robert Johnson, the blues man, and the crossroads. All you really need to know for what I'm going to read is that my main character, Nico, is a blues man who sold his soul to the devil and is in hell to get his wife's soul back. Um, and. Um, that uh, one of his chief regrets in his life has to do with the death of his younger brother in a traffic accident many years ago. Uh, we pick up Nico while he's on a frozen plane in hell, and he thinks he sees a river and a bridge in the distance. And Nico's socks squish in his shoes as he navigates the Haiti Arctic waste. Across the broken reach, he hears the flattened groan of streaming ice, and everywhere the ice has parted, he sees remnants of embedded bodies ripped apart by glacial motion. When he looks up again, the bridge has his complete attention. What he had taken for wavering air is really the writhing of the bridge itself. The bridge is built of bodies, thousands of them, naked and freezing and huddled against the icy current forever flowing against them and crying moans so terrible they sound like pleasure. They look like ants swarming the body of some animal. But these aren't ants. They're people. Half a mile later, they aren't just people. They're people Nico knows. The bridge is built of bodies of people he has met throughout his life. Teachers, schoolmates, playground bullies, lawyers, doctors, DJs, shrinks, friends, lovers, partners. There are so many. Nico thinks to find another way across, but knows there will be none. There's the ice, and there's the farther shore. And between the two are piled, screaming, and contorted everyone he's ever met who died. He looks up at the cavern sky. You sons of bitches. But in this old drama playing out inexorably as a spring unwinding, metaphors are manifest. And rules and traditions inviolate as natural law. So he picks up his guitar case and heads out to walk across the bodies of those he's known. From the first rubbery step, it is horrible. Their flesh yielding as they ride beneath him. Some reach out to grab his ankle to restrain him. The grip always feeble, but just strong enough to make him shake it off and then feel shame. Still, he casts them off and struggles across their terrible mass holding his guitar case high out of their reach. All of them moan his name. 
He does not want to look into their eyes, but must look down to see which way to step. And in so doing, he must meet their desperate gazes. But they're people, Nico. You knew them. There, to one side, is the outstretched arm of a woman who looks just like a grown-up version of Ann Ellison. The freckled girl he vied with for the spelling bee championship throughout all of elementary school. Even agonized and calling out his name, her woman's face contains a ghost of the girl she used to be. And now among the voices calling out his name is that of Aaron Farrell, a whiskey-voiced singer who he had dated once and slept with twice and never called again. The cold hand around his ankle now belongs to Mrs. Thompson, his first grade teacher. She had seen the very picture of an upright, moral, God-fearing woman. What was she doing here? He jerks his leg away and kicks the jaw of Stevie Dane, his old drug buddy and high school bandmate in the Spanish Flies. Stevie Dane, who rode a needle right into the ground. I'm sorry, Nico calls out to them all. I'm so sorry. But his cries are lost within the many-throated imprecation of his name. Keep moving. You can do that, can't you? Can you do that? What are you if you can? Which, of course, is why they're doing this to him. Thrust against him now, I'm oh, sorry, rearing from the awful seething now, is Bobby Harris, who had died of AIDS ten years ago. Bobby was a good man. What was he doing here? Bobby Harris was a good man. Bobby's knocked aside by a woman Nico would have recognized no matter how much older she became, because she has the reddest hair he's ever seen. Betty? Nico calls out. Cousin Betty? Her name unuttered for how long now? Betty, Nico had lost his virginity to Betty Towers. Cousin Betty, because they were distantly related, and both had taken secret pleasure in this illicit fact. He wondered about her sometimes, where she was, who she was now, and now he knows. She's dead. She's damned. She's doomed to unending persecution here, used as a pawn to be used by him. Betty's batted aside and buried in the undertow of crawling damned, and Nico screams a wordless howl. This is more than can be born. As Nico heaves his way across the population of his life, his scream becomes a wordless curse against whatever mind could send good people into hell and punish them forever for the arbitrary sins of an eye-blink mortal life. A mind that could use their own humiliation just to show one man what selfish desperation and travesty he'll commit, all to save one of their number venerated by his heart. Thrust against him now is a pale girl, a bald-headed girl, whose name he can't remember. She was young, 12 or 13. The Make-A-Wish Foundation had sent his management a letter she had written. She was dying of leukemia and wanted to hear him play. She had seemed a homesick, fallen angel propped by pillows there. He'd asked her what she wanted to hear, and she had looked at cameras and reporters, and Nico had asked everybody but her parents to leave the room. And then he'd sat and played for her, as if sound waves from vibrating strings could save her, as if whatever tore its way from Nico's core could enter her and make her anything but worse. Unbelievably, she had asked him if he knew ain't misbehaving, and he'd laughed and fumbled his way through it, Remembering it, really, but asking her to hum the melody and picking it out and gradually performing a duet with the sad, pale, hollow-eyed girl smiling and tube-fed there on the white-sheeted bed. He tried to play upbeat, but he was sad. She was going to die. Sad and angry that she would never wear a prom corsage, hold hands in a movie theater, pay her own electric bill, make love, name her baby. And now here she is, still 12 or 13, 
A naked, thin, bald-headed girl who clutches at his leg as if he is some bogus prophet come to trample his deluded flock and give them nothing but his unavailing touch. She calls out, Mr. Nico, Mr. Nico. Her name, what was her name? You don't remember, do you, asshole? You played her some songs, and you joked in a hospital room, and all it cost you was a plane ticket and a day. And when you left, you were sad, but still given some cold comfort that at least you were able to cheer her up some little while. And then she died, and you forgot her. Whatever flimsy truce of old he forged with his own inner demon shatters at the touch of her small hand upon his ankle. The old ebb tide of self-destruction washes through him with an awful and familiar surge. I can't do this. Fuck you. I won't do this. I quit. You win. Nico stops his forward struggle. Hands claw at him. The, the bald-headed girl reaches up toward his face. His hand intercepts hers. Their fingers touch, entwine, and clench. She calls out, Mr. Nico. Nico's weeping, but he doesn't know it. He feels a tugging on his guitar case, long held in his hand, and lets it go. Feels a tugging on his foundering soul, and lets it go as well, and is dragged down. The cold touch of the dead swarms all about him. Will it hurt when they tear into me? Will there be a sleep and a forgetting? And after I am husked and my flayed soul is cast out like a rind into this awful universe of garbage, will I see you ever, Jem? And will you forgive me if I do? Nico's body turns as he is passed among them. Will they crush him? Will he drown beneath the press of cold and naked bodies? What are they waiting for? He opens his eyes, and there is only blackness. He stares up at the cavern sky. All beneath him is a jostle. They're carrying him. Nico is borne aloft atop a coruscating sea of reaching hands, passing him overhead like a concert stage diver, delivering him across the bridge of themselves. For a panic moment, Nico thinks they mean to bring him to the gaping maw of some mad chewing thing that will devour him and so commit him here forever. But look at their faces. Look in their eyes. Even in the midst of such despair, there is a kindled spark of gleeful rebellion. Possibly the first defiance they have shown beyond the closure of their mortal lives. For this brief moment in their endless suffering, they carry Nico across a patchwork history of his peopled life, past, along, and past. Joy floods Nico's heart. It hurts. It fills him with a trembling exultation. It makes him want to die. He lives within its fleeting heat like a moth dived headlong into consummating flame. Joy. Turning now in their collective grip, he faces downward. A man grins up at Nico as his hands reach up to take their share of Nico's weight, too far away to hold him up, but reaching for him anyway. Now he sees the far shore nearing, sees his guitar case handed off toward it like a bucket in a fire brigade, sees a figure standing on the farther shore. He strains for a closer look at it as he is jostled and bumped and turned about, his brief joy now stained by sudden doubt. It had looked like it couldn't be. They wouldn't. His buoyed spirits sank. <coughs> of course they would. Of course they have. Of course they've saved the best for last. Out there on the far shore, beyond the bridge, past Eddie, the ice cream truck man who had given him credit, and Jake, the club owner who had paid off Nico's gigs and drugs, 
there with arms outstretched to welcome him, with the face so like his own, the face that Nico last saw sightless and unmoving, rammed against the steering wheel in a crumpled wreck, Nico's brother, Van. Thank you.